Hello and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. We've covered a lot of material so far, which is actually a quarter of the whole material we have to go through. And we're not even halfway through. But I believe that the things that we discussed so far, uh, they were powerful and exciting for you. And the things to come are even more exciting. And actually today we're beginning uh, the third big chapter where we will begin answering different objections that Christians or people bring from the Bible uh, against healing. And you see, we spend almost six hours in six sessions bringing uh, passages from the Bible and biblical support for healing, that God wants to heal any sickness for anyone, anytime, anywhere, that Jesus did those things, that the disciples did those things, that God healed in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. But still... No matter how much biblical support is brought for the fact that Jesus healed all people that came to him, there will always be the few places in the Bible to which Christians appeal to advocate that we cannot heal like Jesus or that healing is not for today or that healing is not for all people or all sicknesses. And that is mainly because Maybe you or maybe these people prayed for a sick person and they didn't get results. So then they have to come up with an excuse and not really an excuse, but kind of make sense of what's happening and why didn't they get results. And then they come with all these arguments that which which are logical in a way. They have some, some reasoning behind them, but let's find out if they are really true and if they really can hold water, if they, can, if they are really true based on the Bible. Amen? And if you ask any believer why a person would not get healed, what would be the reason? Most believers would bring up what? Paul's thorn, job suffering, or Trophimus, who Paul left somewhere sick, or Jesus not being able to heal everyone in his hometown. And these are the main objections to healing, among other things, and we'll try to cover as many as possible. And let, today we'll begin with the first objection or the first subchapter uh, of this big chapter on God's sovereignty. This is the first objection that we will talk about, God's sovereignty. And the objection sounds like this. God is sovereign and he will heal me only if he wants to, only if he sees it necessary and only when he wants to. Moreover, there are times when he can decide to put a sickness on someone to teach them something or to work something good in their life. Have you heard of this objection? It's pretty common among Christians. And uh, we'll begin answering to this objection by saying this. That the main problem here is that believers confuse the sovereignty of God with the control of God. And they understand, they think that God controls everything. If He is supreme, then nothing on this earth happens without His approval. Now let's see if this is true. If nothing on this earth happens without His approval, does that mean that every evil thing happening in this world is approved by God? No, of course not. So we already see that the sovereignty of God doesn't mean that He approves or allows everything that's happening on the earth. That's one point. Let's move forward. With this. If a person really believed that God is the one who puts sickness on them because he's trying to work something for good in their life, then they should not go to the doctor or take any medicine. Isn't that right? You should not try to get well. If God's will is for you to have that sickness, you would not, you would not try to resist his plans. Isn't that right? They should let the sickness run its course and thereby get the full benefit of God's correction. Of course, no one advocates that. That's absurd. And it is even more absurd to believe that God is the one behind this tragedy. Let's define sovereignty. What is sovereignty? Sovereignty is defined as supreme authority and power, the authority of a state to govern itself or another state, one holding supreme independent authority over a region or state, 
one that does not have to answer to another entity in the governing of its affairs. So it's supreme authority and power and independent authority. It's not influenced by anyone. But now divine healing doesn't affect or interfere with God's sovereignty. In fact, it's act it actually establishes it. How? Because we are God's ambassadors on earth to enforce his sovereignty, to enforce what he has spoken, what he has said. God's sovereignty doesn't mean that he can do whatever he wants and when he wants it, whenever he wants it, and that he can change his mind about something anytime or just change things whenever he wants to. That's not sovereignty. Otherwise, he would be unrighteous. If God said something and then the next day he changes his mind, he wants to do something else, then he would be unrighteous. I mean, even the kings of the earth, when they decree something, or the lawmakers, when they decree something, they sign something, they cannot just change their mind so quickly. But God is sovereign. That doesn't mean that he changes anytime. He does whatever he wants, whenever he wants. That's not sovereignty. In fact, God does whatever he wants and whenever he wants because everything that he does is right, is righteous. So he does whatever he wants, whenever he wants, but once he does something where he says something, he doesn't change his mind. Amen? So the sovereignty of God is not the fickleness of God. God is not fickle like wanting to do something today and then the next day do something else. We as, human, uh, we, as humans, we are fickle. We change our mind very easily. But God doesn't change his mind so easily. He, the Bible actually says he doesn't change. He doesn't change in his nature, in his character, but he also doesn't change what he has said once he said it. He has the freedom and the ability and the liberty and the sovereignty to say, to speak whatever he wants and do whatever he wants. But once he spoke it, he cannot change it. It's eternal. Amen? Generally, people don't question God's ability to heal them. Their doubts arise when it comes to his willingness to heal them in particular, to heal them personally. And let's begin by reading one passage from Mark 1, verses 40 to 42. If you have your Bibles ready, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you are welcome to read from any English version that you have available. Let's read it together. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. I think we read this passage before in previous sessions. We already can see here that Jesus didn't even think about, didn't even pray about. He immediately said, I am willing, be cleansed. I am willing to heal you personally. Yes, I can, but I also want, I will to heal you personally. And just like many people today, this leper... The leper didn't question the Lord's ability to heal. He knew that the Jesus could heal him. The Lord can heal him. He probably had heard of his many miracles. People in the, and when Jesus walked on the earth, people heard. He had a fame that Jesus was healing a lot of sick people. And no one would remain sick after he passed through a region. He probably knew of some other lepers who had been healed before by Jesus. That these things, you, you hear about them. When, when someone heals a leper, you will hear about it because this is not something trivial. It's something powerful and supernatural. Yet he wondered, what about me? Yes, I know so-and-so was healed, but what about me? Will he heal me? That's the question. And here it's where God, uh, where people begin thinking about sovereignty, is God's will, will he approve of healing me now, in this place, in this time, of this sickness? Will not his sovereignty get in the way? Maybe he thinks that I need this sickness or that this sickness will work something good in me. And then faith begins shrinking when you start uh, playing with these thoughts in your mind. With much compassion, Jesus stretched forth his hand and touched him even before he was cured. That's interesting. 
the verse says that he stretched out his hand in compassion and touched him before he healed him. He touched the leper, something that no one else would have done for fear of contamination. In that time, you would not touch a leper because you would be contaminated immediately. Yet Jesus, full of compassion, touched him. And by that simple touch, Jesus demonstrated love, compassion, and acceptance to the leper and gave him assurance of his will to heal him as he replied, I will be cleansed. Jesus is so good. He was full of compassion, full of love. And there are those who think that God will only heal someone when he wants to. And when he doesn't, he wouldn't. If God doesn't want to heal me, he will not heal me. He will never heal me. They think whenever God chooses, he will heal me. If he chooses, he will heal me. I'm waiting. I'm patient. Whenever he chooses, he will heal me. But that's not true. It used to be true in the Old Testament because people didn't have a right to God's healing. They were still under the dominion of darkness. Jesus hadn't died on the cross to pay for sickness, to pay for the price for healing. They were still, they were God's chosen people, but they were in sin. They, sin was not paid for yet. Amen. So that's why in the Old Testament, God would decide out of his mercy when to heal and to heal people. And then he gave the law by which he said, choose life. I put life and death in front of you. Choose life. How would they choose life and healing? By obeying the law or bringing the animal sacrifices when they disobeyed the law. So either way, they would have a, a way, they would have a, a path uh, to God's healing, access to God's healing through those two methods. But whenever they disobeyed, they would be under curse. But in the New Testament, Jesus paid for our healing. It's no longer, healing is not, is no longer at God's mercy or God's disposal. He has given us healing. He has put it in us by the new recreated spirit. And we have access to it 24-7, 24-7 of the day, all the time, anywhere for anyone. Let me give you an example here. Imagine that I'm a student in college and my dad sends me money for college. And he would tell me this. I will send you for the whole year, I will send you money, uh, uh, an amount of money every month. I will send it by mail to you. So I received those, that money throughout the semester. His, my dad sends me the money monthly and I lack nothing. That was the way that he operated that whole semester. But then a new semester comes. And my dad says to me, from now on, I have opened a bank account for you in the bank close to your school. And I, I deposited an amount of money in it. And having known what it took you to go through the last semester. So whenever you need money, go down to the bank and get it yourself. When, so I calculated based on the previous semester how much you would need. I put it all in the bank. So now you have to go to the bank and withdraw how much you need whenever you need. Now it's no longer true this semester that my dad sends me money monthly. That was true last semester. But things are different in this new semester. Amen. So now there is a better system. All the money I would need for this semester has been paid to my account. My father opened a bank account and put all the money in it. So now I can go and withdraw. That is the same way God operates with us now in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he would give us healing whenever he decided to, he would give it to us. But in the New Testament, he already given us all the healing that we need. We only need to withdraw it, to bring it into, into the, to manifest it into the material world, into our physical world. Amen? And back in the Old Testament, he said in Exodus 33 verse 19, then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Here it seems that God does whatever he wants. I will have compassion on whoever I want to have compassion and I will be gracious to whoever I want to be gracious. That's kind of how it sounds. And this here, this passage from Exodus during the, uh, uh, while, while the people of Israel came out of Egypt and they were in the desert, the, God gave the law. 
But then he said to Abraham before the law, before the people of Israel were in the desert with Moses. He said this to Abraham in Genesis 12 verses 2 to 3. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Amen. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham to whom all the promises were made. So God made some promises to Abraham before the law, which kind of bypasses the law. When God gave the promises to Abraham, he spoke about Christ, about the seed of Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Because you are in Christ and Christ is in you. And Christ is Abraham's seed. And an heir according to the promise. Galatians 3.16 and verse 29 says this. So now that Christ has come, we are the blessed. God has given us all the blessings of Abraham in Christ. He doesn't have any more blessings he's holding back from us and, say, uh, and saying, whenever I choose, I will give it to you. That's not our God of, in the New Testament. It's not God choosing when to give. He already has given us everything that we need. I, we were seeing uh, in the previous session, he has given us Everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So he has made all the blessings available to us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 3 to 7 says that, that he has made all the spiritual blessings available to us. So let's make a difference between God's sovereignty, which means his independence, his supreme and his control. He's not controlling like a dictator, like a socialist government. He's not dictating, deciding everything about your life, whenever to give, whatever to give. He has given us everything freely and we can enjoy and benefit from divine healing for any sickness, for anyone, anytime, anywhere. Amen? So I hope all these things answer the first objection that God's sovereignty will never be in the way of your healing. He can heal you of anything and he wants to heal you personally anytime, anywhere of anything. Amen? No matter what sins you have, no matter if you prayed, it doesn't matter if you fasted or not, it doesn't matter anything. Healing is unconditional and is in your, it is in your heart, in your new spirit. And God expects us to draw that healing from the new recreated spirit, from the Holy Spirit outside in our body and in other people's lives. Now let's move on on the second subsection of this big chapter with objections. And the second objection I will bring today is the so-called already but not yet theology. I don't know if you heard of this objection, but let's define how, uh, this objection, how it sounds. According to the theological concept of already but not yet, this theological concept is taught mainly in some Bible schools, in, in master degrees, in uh, Bible colleges, in theology. But according to this theological concept, the kingdom of God is already here on the earth in one sense, and believers are in the kingdom, but the kingdom is not yet here in another sense. It's not manifested in its full glory. It will be manifested in its full glory in the new earth and the new heaven. That is why we cannot expect healing to manifest here on earth at all or not at all times when we want or for whatever we want and for anyone, anytime, anywhere. God decides whenever he does these acts of mercy, whenever he wants with whoever he wants. We are healed by Jesus' sacrifice on a promissory note, as a promise, but we will actually walk in health in a continuous way after the second coming of Jesus. While here on earth, God decides when and if to heal or not. That's kind of in a nutshell, this theology already but not yet. Now let's try to answer this uh, to this objection, because this objection can be a blockage in your mind. This objection can stop your faith or can shrink your faith in healing that God wants to heal you personally and that can stand in the way of your faith. 
So the already but not yet paradigm or theology was developed by Princeton theologian Gerhardus Voss early in the 20th century. In the 1950s, George Eldon Ladd, it's a very well-known professor uh, at Fuller Theolog Theological Seminary, argued that the kingdom is described in scripture both as a realm presently entered and as one entered in the future. Ladd concluded that the kingdom of God is both present and future. And I agree with you. I agree and I don't agree. Because there's one sense, in, in there's one interpretation which the kingdom is both here and future, both present and future. And there's another one where it's also both present and future, but it's one is correct and one is wrong. What this theology says in actuality is that the present of the kingdom is mostly based on promises without a consistent, tangible or continuous manifestation in the material world. While the future of the kingdom is the visible manifestation of the kingdom in all its splendor together with the continuous and tangible manifestations in the physical world. What I say now, it's a, a little bit different. What I think the, the kingdom present and future means is the following. Is that in, in the present, the kingdom is invisible. Yeah, we don't, we don't see it with our eyes, with our physical eyes. We don't see it. But its effects and power are tangible and continuous here now. The kingdom is here, is present with us in full power, but it's invisible. But its power functions as it will always function. Its effects can be seen, can be consistent, can be continuous by faith. The kingdom is in the heavenly places, is in Christ, and it's present in that way. In the future, the kingdom will just become visible. So the whole kingdom that is now here will become visible. We'll be able to see it with our physical eyes. We'll have glorified bodies and we will see Jesus. We will see each other. We will see people that died. That's kind of the, the future of the kingdom. But the present, it's as powerful as it will be in the future. Because the Bible says in many places when Jesus came on the earth and he healed people, cast out demons, he said the kingdom has come. The, the substance of the kingdom, the the if you want the, what the kingdom means is healing, is deliverance, is that's what kingdom means. So the power of king of the kingdom is here. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came and died on the cross so that he would bring down the kingdom. He would bring down the will of God from heaven to earth. And he left us to enforce that kingdom on the earth and to proclaim that gospel, the gospel of the kingdom and to manifest the gospel of the kingdom through signs and wonders, through power and to heal people. So I'll try to answer this objection by going through every so-called biblical support of this theology step by step and respond to it. So the, uh, I'll read a few passages from the Bible that support that are supporting this theology already, but not yet in the wrong way. Let's read Hebrews 2, 8 to 9. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So Christians' adherents of this theory say that now, now, we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor, but with all that, we do not yet see all things put under him as it should be for a king already crowned. So we, we see now that Jesus is crowned with glory and honor, but we do not see... Uh, on the earth, all things put under him as it would be with the crowned king. We will see all those things put under him, under Jesus, under the king, after the second coming of Jesus. That's what this theology says. Now, my problem with that interpretation is the following. Why should we automatically imply that those all things will be subdued and put under him after the second coming? Why we would automatically think that? Because the verse doesn't say that. Why wouldn't they be subdued by believers in Christ now while we are on earth? Since Romans 5.17 says that those who receive the abundance of grace here on earth, we receive the grace here on earth, shall reign in life in the same way death 
reigned on the earth until Christ came. So death reigned on the earth until Christ came and died on the cross. So why now wouldn't we reign in life as death reigned before Christ? Now we reign in life because we receive grace here on the earth. We didn't receive it in the future life. We already received grace. So we reign in life here. We will continue to reign in the future life, in the, in the new earth and the new heaven. But we already began reigning here from the spiritual realm. We reign over physical circumstances, over the material world. Yes, not over other people, not over their wills, but over darkness, over negative things, over negative circumstances. We can reign and have those things under our feet. They are already there. We just need to keep them there and subdue them and reign over them. That's what God called us in Christ, called us to. What are we as believers supposed to do until the new earth and heaven come on the earth? On this, on the earth? Are we supposed to just endure darkness and endure whatever the devil wants to do to us and be at God's mercy whenever he wants to intervene and decide whatever he wants to do? No. Yes, there is a sense in which the subjection of all things will become fully visible with our physical eyes and final, permanent, after the second coming of Jesus. But to what use will the gospel be to us then when we are no longer in the presence of our enemies? We are no longer in the presence of sickness in the future life. Here is where we are in the presence of our enemies. Here is where God expects us to fight the fight of faith and win. Not be trampled upon sickness and darkness. He wants us to be winners, overcomers, because Jesus has overcome. If Jesus would, behave, would have behaved like we behave today, he would not even get to the cross. But he fought the fight of faith and he won. He overcame and he told us, dare to fight because I have overcame. I went through all the possible temptations before you, but I overcame. I overcame sickness. I overcame death. And I expect you to overcome too. You are more than overcomers in Christ Jesus. And greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. We are sons and daughters of God, born of God. And we overcome the world, First John 5, 4 says. And what is the thing that overcomes the world? Our faith in the word, in what God has spoken about us. That's what gives us the victory over the world over the darkness, over the flesh. It gives us victory, not endurance and resistance. Amen? Let's continue. First John 3, 2. This is another passage that uh, uh, apparently, supposedly supports this theology already, but not yet in a wrong way. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. According to this theory, to this uh, theology, again in the verse above, we have a now. We are the children of God and we have a not yet, our future state. We are children of the king, but we must wait to see what that entails. How will that uh, how we will be as sons of God in the future, in the future life. I agree that when he will come back, when Jesus will come back, we shall be like him physically. Yes, we will have glorified bodies. We will look different and we will be different. That doesn't mean that in between we, can do, we cannot do anything or that the gospel didn't provide anything for us here while on earth. After the second coming, Jesus will become visible our bodies will become glorified, as I said, I mentioned earlier, and everyone will know who are the sons of God. They will see it visibly. But until then, we have a job to do as sons of God. We have a job here to advance the kingdom. We're not called to just endure and resist uh, darkness coming over us. We are called to fight and win and bring glory to God through that. Romans 8.30, another passage in, that uh, is supposedly supporting that theology. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, that these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. 
the already and not yet theology says that we don't feel very glorified. And that's true. We don't feel with our physical sense. We don't feel glorified most of the time. And that is because the present spiritual reality does not yet match up with the future physical reality. That's what this uh, false theory says. I call it false from my point of view. I studied this theory, this theology in school, in Bible school and in master. And as I said in the beginning, it's true in one way, but it's false in another way. So I'm trying to show you what I think the already and not yet really means. And it shouldn't be in, uh, in the way I show it to you that it really means it shouldn't be a blockage against in the way of a faith of your faith for healing. Amen. So that's why I'm trying to debunk this theory. If you ever heard of this or if you will ever hear about this, it's not an obstacle against your healing because healing is here. It's not a not yet thing. Healing is fully here. Healing will not need healing in the future life because we will not be sick. Healing, we need healing here. Here are the giants of sickness and disease that we need to fight and overcome. So in this, in the verse above, predestination and justification are spiritual things. If we think that the glorification uh, this verse talks about is physical, we are also glorified already. So if we think that this, uh, this verse talks about physical glorification, about the future physical glorified bodies, then yes, we don't see our bodies yet visibly glorified and we don't feel glorified because we're not physically glorified. Amen? However, the verse talks about a spiritual glory of God, not a physical glory. Because also justification and predestination, they are spiritual things, invisible things. It talks about a spiritual glory of God that has been restored to the new creation at salvation. It talks about the glory of God. In Romans 3.23, the Bible says that when Adam sinned, we fell short of the glory of God. We had the glory. And now that glory has been restored in the new creation. I don't know what kind of body he had, if it was a glorified one or not. But the glory that the Bible refers to is not, is not a physical glory. It's a glory of God. When the Bible says that uh, when Jesus uh, transformed uh, wa water in wine, the Bible says that that was the first time when Jesus manifested his glory. So that wasn't a physical glory. It was the glory and the power of God. So when the Bible says here that we were already glorified, it means that we were already uh, brought into glory. The new creation, the new recreated spirit is full of the glory of God. It's full of the power of God, of the fullness of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 6, 13 says this. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. For our glory. He ordained this wisdom for our glory. Not God's glory. Yes, he receives the glory, but he ordained for our glory. Which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So Jesus was the Lord of glory even before he got the glorified body. He had the glory, but as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them, these things, to us through his Spirit. A lot of people think that these things that the eye has not seen, ear not heard, are the future things. But they are not. They are not. This passage doesn't talk about the things in the future life. See that in verse 10 that God has already revealed these things to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. So we know of these things. He has revealed them to us. What are these things? For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. We have received the Spirit of God. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So the things that the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard are the things that God has freely given to us. 
and the Holy Spirit has revealed them to us when the Holy Spirit came into us. What are those freely given things that we, we talked about in Romans 8, 32, that he did, did not spare his own son? How will not much more with him give us freely all things? So these things like healing, prosperity, he has revealed them to us. Verse 13, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now let's notice a few other things in this big passage. That the wisdom of God, as I said before, was predestined for our glory here on earth. You see that in verse 7. Because after that, all of the passage begins describing what is that glory. These things that the eye had not seen, the ear has not heard, which things has been freely given to us and they have already been revealed to us. So the glory that God predestined through his wisdom for our, our glory is, consists of these things. Then in verse 8, we see that the Lord is the Lord of glory. And then what is that glory? Verse 9 tells us that the glory consists of things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard. I'm repeating these things because we, we, we read so easily, so fast through this passage and we don't realize uh, the context and what this passage actually says. This is powerful. What are those things? They are things revealed to us, things freely given to us by God, things of the spirit which the natural mind does not understand. So the things that God has freely given us are our glory, which is healing, prosperity, success, victory. Let's see one more passage in John 17 verse 22 about this glory. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Jesus prays here in John 17, and he says, The glory that you've given me, Father, I have given them. So Jesus gave the disciples a glory, and he gave it to the new creation implicitly. He gave us his glory. And then 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory here on earth, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as we look as in a mirror to the glory of the Lord, we see the glory of the Lord in the mirror. But when we look in the mirror, we see ourselves. So uh, we are the glory of God. The glory has been restored to us because when we look in the mirror... We see the glory of the Lord and we see ourselves. And we are being transformed into the same image that we see, the glory of the Lord from glory to glory. Where? In the future life? No, here. We are here called to experience glory, to experience the power of God, to work out the power of God and the glory of the Lord out on the outside, from the inside out. So we have been fully glorified in our spirits at the moment of salvation, we carry the glory of the Father wherever we go, but the glory is manifested through us on earth in stages, depending on how much faith we release, how much knowledge and understanding we have, how convinced we are and persuaded of the Word of God, how much we believe it and declare it, according to our beholding and renewal of the mind. So the more you renew your mind to your new identity, to who God made you to be at salvation, the more glory you release, the more life you release, the more faith you release. Amen? And you grow from glory to glory. You manifest more and more glory as you, as you come closer to, to, the, to the end of the age, to the new life, to the new earth and a new heaven, to the future life. So we are called here to reveal the glory of Christ. Amen? And one, one more passage. Ephesians 2.6 says this. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And again, this is a passage that supposedly supports the wrong interpretation of the already and not yet. So the already and not yet concept says... The, the one that I don't agree with, says that our surroundings do not much resemble heavenly, heavenly realms. But the Bible says that we sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. So they say that the Bible says that now we sit with Christ in the heavenly places, but we don't see yet those heavenly realms. We don't, uh, we don't see them around us. That's what this theology says. So that's why... It's the kingdom is already and not yet. 
But let me answer this to, to this objection. The heavenly places realm is the whole invisible realm around us, as I said in a previous session, which includes our earth, the first heaven, second heaven, and the third heaven. Because in the heavenly places, Ephesians, if you read the whole book of Ephesians, you will see that in the heavenly places there are forces of darkness, us, and Christ himself. So although heavenly places are not physically visible, they nevertheless govern the physical world now. And we govern the physical world from that realm. We are called to take responsibility for our physical world and govern it and reign and have dominion. Amen? And help people, serve people. So the already and not yet camp also claims that the Bible never speaks of advancing the kingdom, but the kingdom will come. So they think that the kingdom is not here, but the kingdom will come in the future life. Let's see the, uh, a passage that supports, kind of, they say that supports their, this idea. Luke 11 verse 2. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So they, based on this verse, they say that the kingdom has not come yet because Jesus was praying, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth. So his kingdom was not yet on the earth and his will was not yet done on the earth. But this was before the cross. Jesus' prayer above was before he died and resurrected. Yes, there is a visible and manifested kingdom of God to come in the future life. But the kingdom has already come on the earth in an invisible way and full power. Amen. Its effects and laws are in full operation now on the earth. Luke 10, 9. And heal the sick there and say to them. Jesus says this. Tells the disciples. Go and heal the sick there and say to them. The kingdom of God has come near to you. And then Luke 11 verse 20 says, But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the already and not yet camp also claims that the kingdom is currently not of this world, according to John 18 36, and we'll read it in a minute. And that based on Jesus' parables of the kingdom, the kingdom is slowly working toward an ultimate fulfillment. It is not sporadically breaking through to bring us comfort in this world. That's what the already and not yet camp says. And verse John 18, 36 says this. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I, would shut, I, would, I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So based on this verse, the already but not yet camp says that the kingdom is not, here, is not of this world, is not here. It will be in the future life. But what Jesus meant here was that his kingdom is not like the physical kingdoms. That, I mean, if you look at the verse, this is what Jesus implies. That his kingdom is not like the physical kingdoms of the world and it doesn't, it doesn't function in an earthly way. And that's true. But that doesn't mean the kingdom is not here. Its nature is not earthly. It's spiritual. The nature of the kingdom of God is spiritual. It's not earthly. That doesn't mean the kingdom is not in this world or that it's not real. Amen. Look at this passage in, in, and what Jesus implies. That it's not that the kingdom is not here, but the kingdom, its nature, its substance is not earthly. That's what he meant. So now we conclude this subsection. And besides the responses above that I already discussed uh, on, I also want to, make, to bring a few more arguments. And these are the following. It seems that according to the already and not yet concept, the not yet cancels completely the already while we are on this earth. Isn't that true? I mean, yes, it is, but not yet. But we, we focus on the not yet because the not yet cancels completely. We, we don't have access to anything. Isn't that right? So the, this concept, if we believe it, it cancels our faith in what God has said. Because, yes, it's already, but not yet. So whenever we try to pray for healing, what if it's not yet for me? So that cancels your faith. It doesn't do us any good to our faith. It kills faith, actually. We are more slaves than sons, while on, according to this concept. We are more slaves to darkness than sons in reality. If we are sons just on promise, here while we are on earth, before the future life, we are slaves. To darkness, to sickness, to, and that's not true. 
We are dead to sin. We are no longer. Sin does not have dominion over us here on earth. We are under grace. Grace repels sickness. Hallelujah. This concept definition, another argument, this concept definition focuses very much, if you notice on all their passages, it focuses very much on visible things and not spiritual. If I see healings, then the kingdom is here. If I don't see them, then the kingdom is not here. That's pretty much the idea. It focuses a lot on what we experience, on what we see, what we, the results that we see. And I was saying in the beginning of this session that the word has the final authority. We need to enforce the word, the word of God to change the circumstance and not the other way around. This concept does the other way around. If it doesn't happen, if I don't see it, then the word of God is not good or it's, it needs to be changed somehow. So if I don't see the healings, if I don't see the miracles anymore, then the kingdom is not yet here. That's kind of the conclusion. And it's not true. We, we don't look at visible things. We look at the spiritual things. We set our minds on the unseen, the Bible says. Fix your mind on the unseen. The unseen is not necessarily the future life. Oh, I'll think about the future life and I'll encourage myself to hold on and to endure. No, that's not the Bible. That's not what the Bible means when it says to fix your mind on the unseen things and things above. Things, the things about the things unseen are exactly these things that I'm talking about. The spiritual things, the things that God has given to us, those are the unseen things, the unseen kingdom. Also, this concept makes the word of God and the promises to us void, empty. They are nothing. That's another argument. If the kingdom is not yet here, then how can I have faith in God? How can I believe God for something if the kingdom is not here? If I don't know for sure what is here and what is not here yet, how can I have faith? What is the fight of faith in this context? What is the fight? What am I here to fight for? There's no fight of faith. It cancels it altogether. Is the fight of faith just to remain faithful to God until the end and endure being stepped on by the devil? Is that it's that the, is that the fight of faith? No. The fight of faith is to continue to believe and overcome. Whenever things that come uh, that are not supposed to come on you, they come and to prove God's will, to prove God's word. Amen. I have two more two more arguments to completely kill this objection. This concept also shifts if you if you if you look careful. If you think careful, this concept already but not yet also shifts the responsibility and the blame from us on God. As I, I mentioned in another session, if healings don't happen, then it's because God is sovereign or the kingdom is not here. And that kills your faith. And I am absolved of any responsibility. If God is sovereign, well, the kingdom is not here. I'm not responsible. I'm not responsible if things don't happen. There is no place where maybe I don't have enough knowledge and understanding of how things should work. Or maybe I don't have enough faith. I didn't release enough faith. Or maybe I didn't persevere enough yet. Or maybe I don't know all things. There's no place like this. There is no fight of faith at all on our part if we believe this uh, theology already but not yet. But there is a fight of faith, there is a perseverance, there is more knowledge and understanding how to believe and how to overcome by faith. And the last argument is that the kingdom of God on earth in the church era, it's like the electrical uh, power or like the flying phenomenon. Before the electric power was discovered, it was in full operation in the world ever since creation. From Genesis, we had electrical power in the world. It was already here, but not yet discovered and manifested, but it was here. Once it was discovered, although invisible, it impacted our physical and visible and material world in an extraordinary way. Isn't that right? I mean, now we, uh, we cannot even imagine life without electrical power. Electrical power, it's invisible, but we see its effect. It's in full power here. In the same way with flying, the flying laws were given already here on earth since the creation of the world. If we knew the technology, we could have fly, uh, flown in, in Genesis. If we knew how to build planes, how to fly, we could have done that in Genesis. 
Those laws were here, but they were not yet manifested until someone discovered them. And then they were here and impacted our world tremendously. Now we can travel all over the world by, by plane. We no longer have to go just by train or car or by walking, as a lot of people did before we discovered cars and trains and all these means of transportation. In the same way, the kingdom of God is in full power here. We just need to, to receive revelation from the Holy Spirit of how those laws work, how the word of God works, what is ours, what we have a right to and access to and a privilege to and a responsibility to, and then put it to work. That's how the kingdom functions here. So today we cover these two big objections that God is sovereign and the God is, uh, God's sovereignty can block our faith. And the second was the theology of already but not yet. And I explained that this is true but in a different way that is put by most Christians, this already but not yet. Yes, the kingdom is in full operation here but is not yet visible with our physical eyes. And uh, of course, in the future life, there will be, I'm sure there will be other things that we will discover and we will manifest more than this on this, uh, on this earth. But while we are here on earth, we know a few things. We know that we have access to healing. We know that we have access to casting out demons and, he and raising the dead. And at least if we focus only on these three, and we have prosperity, of course, prosperity, blessing, favor. If we focus only on these, it's already extraordinary. But let's do this, this first, and not think about other things like flying or teleporting. We probably we can do those too on this earth because uh, a lot of people will ask me now, so if, we ha if the kingdom is here and we have access to everything, now we can call angels or fly. This is nonsense. Did God promise that we can call angels? Did he say in the word, whenever we need, call an angel, it will appear? No, but he said something about healing. He said something that Jesus Christ Paid for our healing, paid for our sin, paid for our prosperity, paid for, uh, paid for our favor, for our blessing here on earth. And we should, get, should benefit from that, should get advantage of that. Amen. Until we meet next time, may God bless you and keep you and give you more revelation in the name of Jesus. Amen.